Hello, I'm Tom Van Coverden, President and CEO of the National Association of Community Health Centers. Recently, our National Chairman, Kawila Clark, convened a meeting of health center leaders from across the country, starting with our board of directors and a diverse group of over 250 health centers, to look at the current situation that we as health centers face and what it is we need to do to build and develop our own future. This was a key meeting because now with the Supreme Court decision related to the Affordable Care Act and the elections behind us, a lot of action is going to occur over the course of this year, which will demand our focused attention. In fact, it'll have a lot to do with shaping our very future. First and foremost is the issues related to funding. The current FY13 appropriations, the sequestration, uh, fixing the funding gap, uh, and those kinds of issues, as well as the very future of Medicaid, those are public policy issues which we confronted. The second are issues related to the implementation of the Affordable Care Act, rules and regulations defining the insurance exchanges, the role of essential community providers, what defines a qualified health plan, and the benefits that will be provided. And lastly, we took a hard look at where we stand and what it is that we have to do in order to actively play and succeed in these new uh, healthcare, uh, the new healthcare environment uh, that we will be facing very, very shortly. In fact, key deadlines are being set, as you well know, with regard to the exchanges, with regard to the plans and the forming of plans, with regard to the starting of enrollment uh, under the Affordable Care Act. With enrollment starting September 1st of this year, and by January 1st, 2014, full implementation of the Affordable Care Act. So we met to take a hard look at the environment, what changes are occurring, and what things did we need to do as an entire community health center movement uh, to participate and actively play in that, in that game. Uh, the first conclusion uh, we reached in the broadest sense is that all health centers had to be informed and understand what was going on and how the recommendations that were being made at this meeting would be shared by all our community health centers. After all, the success we have made throughout our entire history has been dependent upon how all of us play the game, how well informed we are, and how we interact with each other and with other partners in the healthcare system. With this in mind, we have produced this video to help board members and staff at all community health centers better understand the challenges and opportunities that we all face together. Then what are the new challenges that we face for the next year when you start with the implementation of health care reform? So where do we need to go over the next year? How do we go beyond the group here? And that's where we're begging you, asking you for your help. You are the leaders. For our first panel, we took a look at the perspective of payers those who will be controlling the money and paying for health care services going forward to try and see their different perspectives on what, as payers, they would be looking for from the people they will be contracting with. Our first speaker, uh, fortunately, that we capture on this film is Mark, Dr. Mark McClellan, uh, a longtime friend of health centers, the former head of the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, a former FDA commissioner, and White House uh, counsel uh, and to the president and serving on the Domestic Policy Council. We're also fortunate to have another friend uh, with him representing a major uh, hospital system, uh, and that is uh, Dr. John Benz uh, from South Florida, representing a public hospital with over 160,000 patients. Now, the Affordable Care Act is going to make a big difference in availability of care for those individuals, but it's not going to make the out-of-pocket cost problems go away. That's right. still going to be a big front and central issue for them, and any help that they can get in meeting their medical needs at a lower cost is just going to get more and more urgent. Mm -hmm. At the same time, the other big trend to think about is changes in the way that healthcare is going to work. I do think the importance of primary care as a set of activities is going to continue to increase. I know many of the CHC members have been serving as 
you know, de facto medical homes for some of the most vulnerable patients in the United States. A growing number of them are qualified as uh, NCQA uh, certified mm -hmm. uh, uh, medical homes. And the, and goal I think the goal is 100%. The goal is 100%. That's, that's, a, that's a great goal and the sooner the better. What constitutes primary care is, I believe, going to continue to evolve. Part of that's just driven by demand with more people coming into coverage, with uh, a greater array and complexity of services that need to be coordinated. Mm -hmm. That means you're going to have a greater need for primary care providers, but uh, I think many of those providers are going to end up not being physicians, and I'd like to make a distinction between consolidation, meaning mm -hmm. different parts of the healthcare system coming together, so physician groups being bought by hospitals, forming a large integrated system that way, mm -hmm. and well-coordinated care, which may or may not involve sort of the full consolidation and ownership mm -hmm. and everything that goes along with that. What I see happening more is pressure to get that care right at the person level and maybe more flexibility in how we get there. And this is where I think an uh, important message and thing to look forward to for CHCs uh, comes in. The future is definitely in the direction of more measures of patient experience, more measures of outcomes, particularly patient reported outcomes. Uh, but CMS is starting somewhere, you know, with the measures they have now, which is a set of 33. The healthcare does need to evolve away from just paying more for more services and more complications. Yeah. And so what's really driving the ACO movement is the technology moving towards individualized care mm -hmm. and the pressure on financing to keep overall costs down or moving towards payments that are tied to overall results for the patient. It doesn't happen overnight. The organization needs to get familiar with um, managing care at the patient level, not just you know, making sure they can pay for the cost of the, uh, the fee-for-service cost of the services they're providing, but uh, doing maybe a broader array of services that include things that weren't traditionally paid for. So for the CHCs, I think the important thing to keep in mind is that goal. The question shouldn't be, who can I consolidate with, but what's the most efficient way to get the overall cost down and get the quality of health, the quality of care and health up for the population we serve. Because if you think about it, the, the patients who have the most need for this overall uh, care coordination are the ones that you're serving. They often have uh, uh, chronic diseases that need to or be managed, sometimes with specialties and sometimes that uh, need hospitalizations. Mm -hmm. And they're the ones who are least able to afford all this care if it's not coordinated and delivered efficiently. So I, I hope that we're going to see some more progress down this road. I think the, the thing that um, healthcare leaders shouldn't do today is say, well, you know, we'd like to do all these things, but the financing isn't there, so we're just going to wait. It's a cultural approach that requires a CEO level focus on an ongoing basis. It requires new kinds of relationships with partner specialty organizations and hospitals and new kinds of relationships with payers. Making sure we are well positioned to enroll everyone uh, who is eligible into Medicaid or one of the new uh, exchange subsidy programs. That's going to be a big boost for uh, their access to care and their uh, financial support and potentially a big boost for CHCs. And, and that's the, the changes in delivery. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, you need to have a plan uh, for moving beyond uh, thinking just about the primary care needs of your population that you mm -hmm. serve to their comprehensive needs. Get those uh, connections in place with the specialty groups, hospitals, long-term mm -hmm. post-acute providers, maybe pharmacies. There are lots of examples out there of uh, different ways to go yep. about it depending on where you're starting from. And have a strategy for aligning the financing. So it's, it should be about alignment. Clinical transformation matched with financial steps to make that clinical transformation possible. Mr. Benz shared with the audience the results of his major strategic planning uh, for the hospital system in Florida. The conclusion was grow or shrink. Either we had to grow our revenues or we had to cut our costs or do both. The, the issue of ensuring access. Um, our strategic plan said that this, these 160,000 people probably have a pent-up demand in the factor of anywhere from 1.5 of the normal person to 4.5 of the normal person. We can't even handle the demand today. Okay? And uh, this, this incremental demand for this next three to five years until we get control is uh, going to take everything. And in addition to, man, to manning up for it, we're tooling up for it. We're basically bringing in some of the best business intelligence tools to figure out the gaps analysis, the predictive 
the predictive analytics, and we're going to look at our population as if it's 2017, not 2014. In the case of uh, hospitals, they're going to go away. As you know them today, they're going to go away. We're doing uh, everything we can to do an evaluation of every asset, every bed, every service we have. Because as you do more preventive care and you do more ambulatory care and you do more primary care, my volume is going to dissipate. If you had $8 billion a year, which would be about amount, amount paid in total services in my little community, would you design the system the same the way it is today if you had that $8 billion and you could do it all over? And the answer is no and hell no. Huh? So you've got to think about that question every time in your own, in your own uh, centers okay, and where you are. Yesterday I spent half a day negotiating a product, the silver product, Okay, for the exchange to be put in place on 1114. Why yesterday? A lot of these companies who own small businesses and have, who insure small businesses and individuals, see their business going out of business. And they are now setting up for like what I call Medicare Advantage type of mentality. They know that at 1114, they have to offer a product. They know that they have 90 days to recruit it, so October 1, they have to be ready to put out their enrollment, their sales pitches. Come 6.30 or 7, 1, they have to be done their actuaries to basically make the financial statements and the application to be on the exchange. By 3.31, they have to have it priced. They don't even know what their delivery system is in most cases. Now, I want to ask you to take an action when you get back home is find out who is the underlying primary care delivery system for each product being put on the exchange for 1114. And if you're not there, you better go find your hospital, you better go find your plan, because this is the train, and it's at the beginning of the ride. And if you can get on that, that train at the beginning of the ride with the coverage of a hospital helping you or your partners helping you, now is the time, between now and March 31st. By the time it gets to a 1114, train's left. Against the backdrop that Drs. McClellan and Benz painted, let's take a look at what emerged as a set of concerns and needed actions. First, Many presenters spoke to the urgency of making informed strategic decisions. We have to look at this as a sense of urgency. We must create that sense of urgency that will result in health centers being a major and trusted source of essential information for our, our patients, the community, legislative partners, policymakers, the media. How do we create that? Negotiations. Do it now. You need to become part of the products. You need to become mainstream delivery system. Partnership in this world around here, I'm going to give you an analogy. You can either have a slow dance or a quick step. And it should not be a one night stand. <laughs> and it should last. And that partnership focus should be the community, not yourself. Second, attendees asked, that learning teams share information in real time. We want to create a method for sharing state negotiations regarding Medicaid payments in real time. And that's really important, the real time piece, because sometimes we don't hear about things until months later. And we're not sure whether that's whether through the uh, you know, share link, a, uh, a listserv, or whatever, but some way that we can get these, uh, what's going on from state to state, uh, brought out, out into the field. Third, we need to use the data that we do have to make the case. Accountability. You know, we all have report cards. Develop your own, develop your own reputation, develop your own image, lay it out there, start selling it. Fourth, we were reminded that we need uh, to increase our name recognition and tout the value that we bring to the table. Now is not the time to be one of America's best kept secrets. We use the FQHC as a mnemonic 
to say, this isn't all that makes us different, but here are some of the key things that make us different. F is fees based on ability to pay. We have to offer a sliding fee scale for 200% of poverty or below. We're not free clinics. We ask people to pay what they can afford to. Q is quality health care for all, with the emphasis on the quality and the all. We have to report data. We are monitored for that data. Our doors are open to everyone, whether you're insured, uninsured, commercial insurance, Medicaid. H is highly competent health professional teams. You're not just going into a single doctor. You have teams working together, behavioral, physical health, dental health, looking at people cradle to grave, trying to help them get well and stay well. And C, the thing that really distinguishes us, community control. We must have community majority boards to keep us true to our communities. Fifth, we need to ensure that our, our patients do not become someone else's enrollees. If I were to get insurance, I think I would remain with Jesse Trice Center. <laughs> this, this, you know, they don't know what's going on in here. I don't know what's going on in here. Well, the centers can do is pass out flyers, because I, like I said, there are a lot of senior citizens and low-income families pass out flyers in the neighborhood, organize meetings with someone that can explain this to them, you know, that can put their minds at ease. And then you have others that don't have insurance, like me. How do I go about it? What is it going to do? What is uh, uh, this uh, health care reform going to do for me? And will I have to pay a fee if I don't get the insurance? It's trust that that community needs to give us. If we want to go after these new patients and we want them to become our patients, number one, we have to make sure that we're part of that community, that we're not just this wonderful health care system out here, that we tie back to their linguistic needs. We tie back to their cultural needs. And we provide health care to them that they can embrace and they can trust. But if we do not focus on the needs of that community, we are not going to change the health care status in that community. We have to make sure that we understand the importance of that consumer, what they really do bring, and we are going to then draw the people from the community because they're going to trust us, they're going to believe in us, and they're going to own us. Finally, on the issue of unity, our strength comes from standing together from acting together. And by acting together and working together as a team, right from the health center level on up to the states, to our national association, we can succeed, we do succeed, and we will succeed. The first one is unity. And this is a quote from someone who actually said this, we are stronger when we stand together and act together. You know, we are stronger, than, a chain is as strong as its weakest link. Then the other is staff and boards. We must ensure that our staff and boards, board members are well informed. We have to make sure they know what's going on. And that's up for us to do that. And not rely on them to read things, bring things at every one of the board meetings, be it PCA board, a health center board, network board, we need to be informing what is the latest. And you really do have to do that because it changes weekly for us. It's not enough that your management, top management, tr uh, get trained and attend meetings. Your line staff and that whole continuum of staff is as important as your CEO and your board because they can make or break you. Your billing staff can make or break your organization. And if they aren't properly trained, if they aren't motivated and they don't know what's going on and see how they fit, they can hurt your organization. We concluded with NAC's board chair, Kawila Clark, charging all of us with the task ahead. Thank you. And that's what our job is, is to wear down any obstruction or barriers that we face by being persistent and consistent in what we do. And I will end with a question. Are we ready? Because yes. if you have to ask, am I ready, then you're not ready. Ha, 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 ha.
And the reason I say that is because whatever happens and whatever comes our way, we have to be ready to handle it. 